In this first lecture, we're going to examine what is statistics, and we will examine a couple of concepts such as data types, data collection methods, random sampling, and so forth. So statistics is a very important topic in any management education, largely because managers are expected to make decisions, and if they're going to make decisions, those decisions have to be based on some sound analysis of data. We need tools to be able to take data, analyze it, and create useful information so that we can make really good decisions. So statistics is really all about trying to gather really meaningful information out of data that we collect. So let's explore a number of topics just in an introductory sense so that we could begin to understand and appreciate the importance of statistics. So what is business statistics? Essentially, we have a number of tools and techniques that allow us to collect data and add and create meaning out of that data that we collect. So for example, if we were to look at, uh, say, enrollment figures at the university, and we monitored those enrollment figures over time, we could do some analysis and sort of be able to perhaps uh, estimate whether or not there will be a growth next year, or whether or not there will be a decline, or whether or not the um, level of enrollment would actually remain more or less the same. So by analyzing the data, we could see whether or not there's a pattern, or whether or not there's a trend either upwards or downwards, or a fairly stable pattern that shows no growth either, or, or decline in, 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 either, in either direction. So analyzing information, or analyzing raw data that we collect certainly can benefit business managers. Now, when we think about statistics, it's what it is that there's a huge body of information, but we will only analyze a small portion of it. And we have terms for those. We refer to that huge body of information or data as the population and a subset of it we refer to as a sample. So we'll come to those uh, definitions fairly shortly. But when we work with statistics, we do two broad categories of analyses. One is called descriptive statistics, and the other one is called inferential statistics. Descriptive statistics, as the term suggests, allows us just to describe the data that we've collected. We're not uh, the data is... Um, fairly uh, broad in scope, which means that there's a lot of variation, or whether or not it's actually narrow in scope, much less variation, or whether or not some numbers uh, in our data occur very frequently and some less frequently and so forth. So we just sort of describe the data. Where are most of the numbers in the distribution and in the data? So descriptive statistics help us to look at a data set and be able to speak about it, to describe it. Inferential statistics, on the other hand, allows us to look at that data and then create information that we could use for decision making. In other words, we infer, we draw conclusions from the data set that we have uh, more or less examined. Okay? Now, in terms of descriptive statistics, you've had, most of you would have had some exposure to that because in, in high school, it is not uncommon for students to have taken some introductory statistics. And in that course, typically, uh, you would have come across things like bar graphs, line graphs, and so on, the mean, the median, the mode, some of these statistical measures. So there is typically some level of familiarity that comes out of your grade 12 exposure to the course. So descriptive procedures, as we mentioned, there's a lot of charts and graphs that we could draw, typically bar graphs, or we could talk about histograms or line graphs and so forth. Um, we have some numerical measures that we could generate, such as the mean, the median, and mode. And we'll define those a bit more when we come to Chapter 3, when we talk about those different types of measures. <clears throat> In inferential statistics now, we do what we call two important things. One is called estimation. That means that we take the sample data and we look at it and try to estimate what the true value is in the entire population. So say we wanted to uh, study, for example, just what does it cost 
an average a family of four to live on for for a year um, we could we could consider a, a number of things that they spend money on what not it is um, utilities um, groceries and so on but we could sort of uh, come to a consensus on what we will actually measure and say we wanted to determine what is the average expenditure by a Nova Scotian family of four. Well, we wouldn't want to have to talk to every single family of four. What we would then do is to sort of look at a sample from the population and use the information from that sample to estimate what it is for the population. So that's what estimation is all about. Hypothesis testing is actually quite interesting. Um, this is a case where you stake a claim and you collect data to try to support your claim. So, for example, we might believe uh, if we're doing some agricultural experiments, we may claim that a one brand of fertilizer for tomatoes, for example, happens to be better in terms of improving the growth, uh, the growth uh, rate of, of a tomato plant is better than another type of fertilizer. So let's call them fertilizer A, fertilizer B, that one is actually better than the other. We could make uh, crazy claims like uh, women are smarter than men when it comes to mathematics. Um, we could uh, come up with other kinds of claims whether or not, uh, for example, the cost of living for a family of four is more expensive in Manitoba than it is in Nova Scotia. Now, of course, we can make those claims, but we really need data to help us prove that statistically. And so that's what hypothesis testing is all about. The classic example of a hypothesis test would be a court case where um, you have a defendant and a jury and a judge, and then you have the prosecution and the defense. So the prosecution basically will claim that the individual is guilty and then the defense will try to refute that claim. But in order to, for the jury to find the defendant guilty, the prosecution must present enough evidence. And that evidence would have to be collected the same way in which we would collect data about um, the cost of living for families. Well, the prosecution have to collect evidence that will show the individual is guilty. And so the decision is either that the person is guilty or not guilty, and that's what hypothesis testing is all about. A fair chunk of the course will actually deal with hypothesis testing. So how can we collect data if we want to analyze data to be able to make decisions? There are several ways that I'm sure some of them you're familiar with. Uh, experiments, uh, so if you think of a lab where you may be testing the impact of uh, different concentrations of an acid on, on say, corrosion, well, that's an example of an experiment. You get an outcome. You're not exactly sure what it would be, but you, you conduct the experiment, you get the outcome, and you measure that. And then you may change the conditions and see what happens. So experiments are, um, are quite common. We've done a number of them in our science courses. Telephone surveys, uh, you get a call from a marketer asking you, will you purchase their product? Or just asking for feedback. And so we collect data that way. We have questionnaires that we may send out to people that we want them to respond to, and we collect the data from the questionnaires once they're filled out. Or we could actually do what we call direct observation. That means that we stand at some location and we watch what's going on and we record what we see. So for example, how do students behave when they move between classes? Do they stop and chat? Do they go to the uh, cafeteria, or do they go have a smoke? Um, you could actually observe the behaviors and record that and get a sense of what students actually do in between classes. So <clears throat> the details of all of that I've already explained, so I'm going to skip some of these slides. Now, the different uh, data collection techniques have advantages and disadvantages. Um, so it depends on uh, what kind of uh, data you're collecting, just how much data you need, the level of accuracy that you desire. All those factors are quite important. Experiments uh, certainly allow us to have 
pre-plan objectives and then control them, but they can be very costly. They could be time consuming, and of course we have to plan quite a bit. Telephone surveys, well, if you're gonna to try to take the yellow pages, not yellow pages, the white pages, and call everybody in, it could be quite expensive. Sorry, I mean, it could, be, uh, it could take a lot of time. It may not be very expensive because if you have free telephone calls in the region that you want to survey, then it's not costing you a whole lot. You simply have to pay for the time of the person who's actually going to place the call and collect the data, all right? Um, as you could see, but in terms of uh, telephone service, people are often bothered by that, so they're not very welcoming of uh, telephone service. And mail questionnaires, well, if you mail a questionnaire, sometimes you get it filled out, sometimes you don't. So you don't, you're not always guaranteed of getting good responses. And direct observation, um, there are advantages and disadvantages, of course. You have a chance to um, basically look at more things than you intended to look at uh, in the beginning. So, for, for example, if I'm observing the behaviors of students, well, while I may have an initial objective of maybe just looking to see how they spend their time, I may also uh, look at not just how they spend their time, but um, the relative amounts of time spent in each type of activity, uh, whether or not they do it with other people or alone. So you could kind of expand the analysis that you, you're doing uh, in, in that case, all right? But there are also disadvantages as well. It can be costly in terms of how much time you have to spend to collect fairly large chunks of data. There are lots of uh, issues that, that can happen. Uh, some of the common ones that we worry about are things like how accurate is the data, whether or not the person conducting the interview is biased and maybe leading the um, person who's responding. Sometimes um, you don't have a lot of responses, and if you don't have a lot of responses, then you don't get a balanced view of what um, the people that you wanted to survey, what they actually think. So let's say you ask the question, um, what do you think about abortion? Well, if only three people answered out of a hundred, then that non-response is actually quite, would, would really skew your results. Uh, so we have to be careful with that. And things like selection bias. If a radio station asked a question, then you're only surveying those folks who actually are listening to that radio station. So there are a number of uh, other types of errors, such as the observer's bias, the measurement error, and the validity of the actual study itself, okay? Now, we said statistics is very important. Where does that term statistics come from? Well, what you have is that the, the data that we are interested in, the full body of that data, so say for example, we were looking at um, what does it cost a student to complete a four-year degree? And if we're just looking at St. Mary's students, then all the students at St. Mary's would represent our population. If we're talking about, um, say, the expenditure on utilities for families in Halifax, then all the families in Halifax would represent that population. But in trying to do a study to gain an understanding of what's happening in the population, often the population is too large, so it will be too expensive to study that population. So we look at a sample, and that sample is a subset of that population. And if we pick the sample correctly, then that sample should reflect that population, so that what we observe in the sample should be a fairly good indication of what the situation is in the population. Okay? A census, on the other hand, is when we actually enumerate every single individual. And governments tend to do that because they want to get a really clear picture of what's going on in the population. So they will conduct census, a census every so many years, every 10 years, and so forth. And um, the reason why the time between the different census uh, is so long is because it's so expensive to do it. All right? Now, it's important to learn the terminology. In a population, if we have a, something of interest to us, so for example, I mentioned the cost, uh, the, the cost of living for a family. Well, if, 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 we could, if I could measure that in terms of thousands of dollars, for a population, we will refer to that as a parameter. So when we are looking at the population, we call it a parameter. 
But if we observe the same thing in a subset of that population, a sample, then we refer to it as a statistic. So the statistics and parameters are the same thing. The context is different. Statistics are to samples what parameters are to the population. So statistics are estimates of parameters. That's a very important relationship that you should try to remember. Okay. Um, how do we collect data from samples? That's a very important um, uh, a very important uh, activity because if you collect data, if, if your sample is poorly collected, then the data that you obtain from it and information and the conclusions that you draw would more than likely be very inaccurate. So it's actually quite important that you collect a really good sample. And they have different ways to actually generate the samples. They have what we call statistical sampling techniques versus non-statistical sampling techniques. So, for example, convenience means that if a good location is at the corner of Roby and Jubilee, then I'm just going to just stand in and make my observations from that point. That's convenience. Judgment is when we ask people based on their judgment, not hard facts, but just what they think. And ratio has to do with us uh, deciding a predetermined portion of the population that we're going to look at. And we'll just uh, grab that ratio. But statistical uh, techniques now is where you select individuals based on some probability. There's a, we could assign a likelihood or a probability of selecting that person or that, in the, that, that um, value or that observation. Okay. So, for example, say I had 100 students and I wanted to select 10 to attend a meeting or a function. Well, if I wanted to select randomly, I could put the 100 names in a bag and shake it. So, if I'm selecting 10, 10 out of 100, that means each student has a chance 1 in 10 of being selected. So, that's an example of a random sample. And Of course, it assumes that when I put the names in, that each name has an equal chance there. I would put them on a, on a piece of paper that's exactly the same size so that one is not biased over the other, okay? And uh, these other techniques um, such as stratified and cluster and systematic, let me just mention them very quickly. Um, stratified random sampling means that the data that we collect, we collect them from different levels. So we could talk about age levels, for example. And so if we sample from say, let's assume that we wanted to collect some data on the preferences of, say, young adults or, or adults. So then we could sort of create uh, different levels, like from 20 to 30, 30 to 40, 40 to 50. So we, we have these different levels, and then we sample in each category um, or each level. So that we call stratified. What we've done is we've taken age and we've created strata, strata would be different levels. Um, cluster sampling, when the data occurs in natural clusters, so when you have cases of drinks, for example, beer, 24 in a case, if I had a thousand cases of beer, each of them having 24, I could take a random sample of say 10 or 15 cases and then examine each bottle in every case. So that's an example of cluster sampling. The cluster is really the case of beer. And then systematic random sampling is a case where we might have data uh, that um, might be arranged in alphabetical order, for example, or in some kind, of, some kind of order, and we want to generate a sample. So what we will do is we'll pick a, a random number, and let's say, for example, eight, and then we will select every eighth, um, every eighth uh, person and then until we get the, the, the sample size that we want. So that's an example of systematic random sampling, okay? We're going to just move through because I've already given you the definitions of those. Last but not least, I want to talk about the idea of data types. What are data types? Well, we could talk about qualitative data and quantitative data. And qualitative data uh, basically would be data that um, that sort of describes an attribute. So we talk about red shirts and green shirts and blue shirts. 
That's qualitative. But quantitative data, we could talk about the speed with which somebody could run. Usain Bolt, for example, 9.58 seconds for a 100 meter race. Um, that's quantitative data, okay? We also have what we call time series data and cross-sectional data. Now, time series data would be data that's, that, that is chronologically ordered, ordered over time. So if we look at sales data from uh, the year 2000 to 2013, we have 13 years or actually 14 years of data. Then if we, because the data will be chronologically ordered from 2000 to 2013, we refer to that as time series data. Cross-sectional data, however, is data that occurs at a fixed point in time. So say, for example, we, were, we, had, we look at all the different Walmarts in Nova Scotia. If we were looking at the sales for all the different Walmarts in Nova Scotia in January of 2013, then that's cross-sectional data. So the time period is fixed, January 2013. What was the total sales in Bears Lake? What was the total sales uh, in Mumford? What was the total sales in Dartmouth? So if we examine all of those, that's cross-sectional data. Now, in terms of the levels of data, we have a hierarchy that um, sort of gives us, um, that, that allows us to take data and put it into um, levels. For qualitative data, that means data that's non-numerical, or categorical data, we have two data levels. One we call nominal, and the other we call ordinal. So nominal data is just categorical data that has no preference or there's not one is not better than the other. There's no ordering. So if we look at shirts that people are wearing in a classroom, and we look at the color of the shirts, and we say, this shirt is red, another one is green, blue, orange, and so forth, purple, black. Well, there's one is, we're not saying one is better than the other. So in that case, that's just nominal data. It's an attribute. It describes what color shirt the person is wearing. But we're not saying that one is better than the other. Ordinal data, however, places things in order. So if we talk about, um, say, grade categories, A plus, A, A minus, B plus, B, B minus, then these are attributes, these are categorical the um, values, but there's an order. An A plus is higher than an A. An A is higher than an A minus and so forth. So that's an example of ordinal data. Interval data is quite interesting. It's data that is numerical, but there is not an absolute zero. The zero is more of a reference point as opposed to an absolute value. So when we speak of temperature, or say customer satisfaction levels and so on, Zero degrees Fahrenheit or zero degrees Celsius is not an absolute value. It's really a reference point. So we cannot say that water at zero degrees have no temperature. It has a temperature. But we've decided whatever that is, we will call it zero. And then above that, um, we have positive values. And then below that, we have negative values. So the values uh, can be expressed in, in, in regular intervals, but the zero is not an absolute zero, it's a reference, okay? So that's interval data. Ratio data is also interval data, but the zero is an absolute value. It has meaning. And not only that, the ratios also make sense. So if we speak of height, weight, all right, volume, so if we say there's uh, zero volume, it means that nothing exists. Zero height, it does not exist. It's absolute. And four pounds is twice the weight of two pounds. And so that ratio makes sense. But in interval data, for example, 20 degrees is not twice as hot as 10 degrees. We cannot express that. How do we express twice as hot? So while the number might be twice the size, it does not mean that the temperature is really twice as hot or twice as cool if we go negative 10 to negative 20. All right? So data levels are important. The ones in, in terms of numerical data, we tend to work a lot with ratio data. 
but we do have some examples where interval data exists. And of course, in terms of qualitative data, we have both nominal and ordinal data that we tend to contend with. All right? So that brings us to the end of Chapter 1, a quick review of that. Um, when we get into Chapter 3, we'll begin to describe the data and get into measures of central tendency and then measures of dispersion as well. But this chapter basically just introduces us to the idea that statistics is all about collecting data and creating meaning from that data. And it only has value when the data that we collect and the information that we've generated is, is used to make business decisions, good business decisions, of course. Okay? So hopefully we have a good sense now of what statistics is about and why it is important. Because good decision making requires good information. And good information comes from data that has to be collected and analyzed.